Welcome everybody back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series. I'm Scott Miller and I am privileged each week to serve as your host and interviewer. Today's an exciting day. You know, you can't, you don't think that the guests can keep getting better and better each episode, but in fact they do. Today we have the prolific author and uh, a relationship advisor, John Gray, joining us. The author of, now I want this to sit with you for a moment. The author of 50 million books sold. John has written over 20 different titles. Dr. John Gray is joining us today, the author of the famous book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, and the current book, Beyond Mars and Venus. Dr. Gray, thank you for joining us. A real pleasure to be with you. I see that your library is kind of rivaling our set here. I'm guessing you read a lot of books as you write as well. Talk a bit about what we see behind you today. Oh, well, this is, you know, 40 years of books. I like books. Yeah, the, the same for us. And we're, we're honestly, we're honored to have you on today. I mean, the fact that people have purchased over 50 million copies of your titles is just nothing short of remarkable. When you started, you know, 20 plus years ago, John, did you ever believe your influence would grow this significant and your impact would be this um, uh, sustained? Uh, I couldn't imagine it. I couldn't. You can't imagine that sort of thing. I couldn't. All I knew is that I had a, a it, Minute from Mars was my third book. The first two uh, did very well without much uh, New York help. And that's how I got a contract with New York. I was uh, rejected before that. But I had sold 50,000 of my book, Men, Women, and Relationships. And they said, if you can do that on your own, literally with no publisher back in those days, uh, we want your book. And so they wanted to buy that book. But I said, no, I'll write a better book. Uh, I had done a lot of uh, research on what people got out of my second book. And one of the things they got is it, that they didn't finish it. So I said, I'm going to write a short, easy book for people to read. <laughs> and uh, then Men From Mars took off. John, all of your success and influence is well earned. Your first book, Men Are From Mars, Women on, Are From Venus, has, you know, shaped relationship discussions you know, for a generation now and for those to come as well. Talk a bit about the main differences. Set a foundation. What are the main differences between men and women? Well, you know, I've been evolving that message. And, you know, there was criticism in the beginning because uh, a lot of people at the time when that came out had the belief that the only reason we're different is cultural conditioning. And if you take away cultural conditioning, men and women are the same. Now, I have no resistance to saying cultural conditioning affects us dramatically. Uh, I feel my books are a positive cultural conditioning to help men and women be happy and relate together. So we want to uh, acknowledge cultural conditioning, but also uh, we are biologically uh, as far apart as the Grand Canyon, uh, like we're from different planets. And if we understand some of those basic universal differences between men and women and how they show up, uh, we can be more effective in correctly interpreting our partners, correctly interpreting what our partner's needs are, correctly setting priorities in our behavior. Certainly, we all want equality, but equality does not mean sameness. If you expect people to be just like you, you're not honoring their uniqueness. So that's why I wrote Men From Mars, and because it was so contrary to what was taught, and it's still being taught in many places that men and women are really basically the same. The book moves on, the message is still relevant, it helps us at this time of big confusion in relationships start to make sense of it all. John, walk, walk through what is consistently different in the, in the 20, 20, 30 years you've been writing about men and women. What are, what are the key distinctions that you believe still are true? Well, let's go to biology because, uh, you know, in order to sort of fend off any criticism to my work, I like to go to biology. It's indisputable. If I talk about brain differences, there's still a lot of back and forth on that, but nobody disputes that our hormones are significantly different. They're what's called female hormones and male hormones. Testosterone is the major male hormone, estrogen, progesterone, and oxytocin are the major female hormones. Now, if a woman is happy, she has the right balance of estrogen, progesterone. If a man is happy, he will have 10 times more testosterone to 20 times more testosterone than the average woman. If a woman is happy and fulfilled, she will have 10 times more estrogen than the average man who's happy. And if she's romantic and if she's falling in love, it has to double again. 
So we know that now our hormones play a big part in balancing hormones helps regulate stress levels. Stress levels, that's cortisol and adrenaline. When cortisol is being produced, blood flow stops to the front part of the brain where you can actually hear another person's point of view and integrate it into your own point of view, where you can actually consider what somebody's hearing when you're speaking, when you can consider what the best outcome would be and how I might have to change what I'm doing to get a different outcome if I'm not getting what I want. All of that behavior comes from this part of the brain, which turns off when our cortisol is being produced. Now, what turns it off is when women's estrogen or progesterone goes out of balance because she's making too much testosterone. Men, on the other hand, it will go out of balance if their testosterone goes up, but they don't have a sense of confidence and control. Being, being at ease with the situation, he doesn't have stress. As soon as stress comes in where he feels danger is there that I can't handle, then his testosterone will turn into estrogen and his testosterone begins to go down as estrogen goes up. And then that causes him to be out of balance as well. If a man is angry, ironically, what people don't know, it's not common knowledge, although it's learned in the last decade, is when men are angry, their estrogen levels are going too high and their testosterone is going lower. So men have a whole new set of communication skills, understand how to lower stress in women by promoting estrogen production and how to support a man if he's upset by promoting testosterone production. So now let's get to behaviorally what some of those differences are. Women often complain men don't listen. And that's because men typically listen to solve a problem because solving problems raises testosterone. To stand there and listen and not do anything, your testosterone will go down. So it begins to feel the symptoms of low testosterone, which are impatience, irritability, and distraction. So, so what will happen is a woman's talking if he doesn't understand that the problem she's experiencing, not always, but if she's talking about feelings that are upset, stressful feelings, she needs to talk in order to balance her hormones. If he can listen, he's actually solving her problem. So that keeps his testosterone up. If men understand that simply by listening and asking questions like, tell me more, huh, help me understand that better. Oh, give me details and look at her and listen, that will actually create a comfort zone for her where she will feel safe, that you're not gonna judge her or be critical of her or diminish her feelings by trying to rush her into looking for a solution. So that's one of the big themes of Men Are From Mars is that men often rush to offer a solution and women often just wanna be heard. Not always, sometimes it's like we're all working this out together, but many times, particularly when emotions are there, which are not positive, if she's feeling frustrated or anxious or angry or what any of that, that's a sign her hormones are out of balance. And by creating a safe space, almost like a hug that says, tell me more, literally what will happen for her is that she will be able to process these emotions and come back to a more positive place. Blood flow will return to the front part of the brain. Now for men, that's not gonna work. For men, if they're upset about something and they talk about their feelings to the person they're upset with, it literally increases estrogen and lowers his testosterone. So what we have is different communication skills, more listening for men to listen more, women to share more in the appropriate setting in the appropriate ways. And that's a whole discussion as well. So for men, when they're feeling stressed, they come home from work. If it was an exhausting day or a stressful day, that means they weren't 100% solving all the problems, but there are obstacles. I don't know what I'm going to do about that. Boom, your stress goes up. You're depleting yourself of testosterone. Your estrogen levels are getting a little higher or a lot higher. Then when you come home, you need what I call cave time. So every man has his cave. And that was the original beginning of that whole idea in America that men in their cave, what's well, a place where a man goes where he's not experiencing the production of intimacy. I'm sorry, the production of, of estrogen. It's a testosterone place where he does things which increases testosterone in a non-stressful way. That could be watching a football game. It could be reading the newspaper, new and different, but relaxed. It could be playing a video game, although that's a weaker form of it, but it does produce some testosterone. The, another one is meditation and stress reduction techniques. Uh, that was for me a big, a big awakening. That's how I understood the cave because Prior to becoming, quote, a relationship expert at 29 years old, I was a monk 
a celibate monk for nine years. And during that time, I learned how to find inner peace without depending upon outer circumstances, without depending on what I ate or the people I was with. I could be solitary and be very, very happy. That's what a monk learns to do. But that actually withdrawing from connection with others rebuilds testosterone. So now you're able to be patient and connect with someone as your estrogen levels go higher, your testosterone remains high. So there always has to be the right balance. And for men, if their testosterone goes low, it's very hard for them to sustain a stress-free state if they're immediately coming home and connecting with their partner. Connecting with your partner would increase his estrogen levels. Already he needs to boost his testosterone. So many times a man wants to just go to his garage, do his hobbies. You know, in the old days, it used to be on your resume, you would put what hobby you had because that was a sign of a well-balanced man. He would work hard and he would have his hobbies and he would have his family. Those are all very important stress management things that you're doing something meaningful, that's work. You have time off from work for yourself and then you have time of surrender and selflessness in your marriage. These are all like parts of maintaining healthy hormone balance inside of us. So the men from Mars, I didn't understand hormones then, I just observed what worked for men and that we men, we need our cave time, then we can come out. Women need to talk and share. They would often say, oh, I just need you to hear me longer. He didn't understand that. And then there's another basic principle, men are from Mars, which is the rubber band theory, where men will tend to feel more romantic and be close to you, be interested in you. But once they get really close, he will pull away for a while, but he will spring back. Now, biologically, what's happening is when he gets really close, his estrogen's going up. That's the intimacy hormone. That lowers his testosterone, so there'll be a need to pull away to rebuild the testosterone until it's high enough so it can support more estrogen without becoming swallowed by it. So he gets close, pulls away, and of course, women don't understand this, so when a man starts to pull away, she thinks, what did I do wrong? And she goes after him, trying to get him to come back, and that just sabotages the relationship because she's going after him, and he'll continue to pull away until he gets enough space to rebuild his testosterone and feel strong attraction to come back. So he's like a rubber band. Let him pull away and he will spring back. And when he springs back, don't slap his hand or he'll pull away again. So the idea is balance is distance and connection, distance and connection. And at those times when he pulls away, what does a woman do? She likes connection. Well, she has a life. She has children, she has friends, she has her work, she has her prayers, all these other ways of connecting it will build up her estrogen and her other female hormones that aren't dependent on him. So once again, what we're talking about is better understanding frees us from taking our partner's differences personally and realizing that's what they need, that's what she needs. And of course, when I say a man needs his space, women need space too, but multiply that times 10 and you have a man who needs testosterone. If a woman says, oh, but I need all my space too, that's usually because she's too far on her male side and if, how to know if she's too far on her male side would simply be she's feeling overwhelmed, she can't feel romantic, she can't feel in love. Those are all signs she's not enough on her female side, which is the estrogen is whenever we're feeling love, empathy, happiness, joy, enjoying what we're doing, that's estrogen producing or progesterone producing. Now, so a summarize all of that is when a man feels I have to do something that gives his testosterone up as long as he's rewarded for it properly so he feels successful. If a woman feels I have to do something, her female hormones generally are not being produced. When she says, I get to do something, I enjoy doing this, I love to do this, her estrogen gets produced. If there's something she has to do, but she also loves to do, now she's in balance. And that's all we're talking about here is understanding how we go out of balance, the symptoms of going out of balance. And when you find balance, that's when you're in the flow state and you're most creative, you're most intuitive, you're most empathetic, you're most tolerant, you're most accepting, and that's the leadership state. John, if anybody is confused how you sold 50 million books, they are not any longer. We could stop the podcast right here. That was fascinating uh, and valuable. As I began to picture my wife and my, myself, you know, after hours in your uh, scenarios there, Rewind a bit. Why did you use uh, Mars and Venus as kind of the, the benchmarks for men and women? Well, in 1981, I remember I stopped being a monk around 1979, and that's where I taught classes on sex. 
Uh, why? Because if you haven't had sex in nine years, you think about it a lot. So I interviewed a lot of women that I had sex with and learned a lot that I didn't know. So I started seminars as I was learning psychology. My seminars were all about people's getting together and talking about sex. And then it turned out to sustain good sex, you needed love. And also around that time, I became a therapist. And so I was learning the power of love. And I realized you cannot sustain love, at least I haven't seen it, when people don't understand how each other are different. But at the time, there was a huge pressure saying we should all be the same. You know, women would say to men, you can't pull away. And men would say to women, why are you being irrational, overreacting and talking about all these feelings? Get over it. So that was ruining relationships. So what I basically explain, had to explain how men and women were different, some of the insights I just shared, I didn't have the biology to explain it, which makes it so logical, makes it all sense. I didn't have that. I just had personal experiences of my clients and myself and my own relationship with my wife of 40 years now. So what happens is I would give talks and there was always some disruptive person in the audience who got really upset with me thinking I'm being sexist, sexist, sexist. And I understand if they hear through their filter, they're, they're thinking I'm saying we should all turn back the clock and women should stay at home, men should make, make the money. No, I'm not saying that at all. So I had to be playful about it and, 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 and make it light. So not like everybody and everything is exactly this way in a playful way. I would kept thinking how to do this. This is my goal every day. It took a couple of years of teaching these ideas to, to come to this discovery where I had just seen the movie ET, if everybody remembers extraterrestrial. And so, and the talk I was explaining to women, imagine if your husband was ET and I was, I was going to say, you wouldn't presume to know what the best food was for him because he's from a different planet. And, that was my point, is that we make all these presumptions of the way people should be when we're really different. You can't do that. You have to learn from them or someone who understands them. So as soon as I said, imagine your husband is an e is ET, all the women started laughing. And then one woman in the audience, she just said, I think she was drunk, but she said, she said, well, where is my husband from? And I just said, Mars. It just came out of me. And she la a whole room burst into <laughs> laughter. And I said, thank you, God. That's the answer to my prayers, you know, because I kept trying, how can I frame this in a way where people don't get all serious and get their buttons pushed and just be open to new information? So that became a very playful talk. That's a great story, John. John, in your current book, Beyond Mars and Venus, one of the premises is that the foundation of good communication is when uh, a couple understands their differences in a way that makes sense to each of them. Expand on that, if you will. Well, I love the way you say it, which is that it makes sense. You see, if you just tell people, uh, you shouldn't be angry, you shouldn't argue, uh, they don't really have any power to change except to follow your advice rather than listen to what they feel is right. But once we understand something, if I told you, you know, if you wanted to leave my office and there was a long walk to the exit and I said, oh, I've got a, a door right behind me. Does it take a lot of willpower to take the easier route? It doesn't. So once we understand something that something is clearly easier and better than something else, it's easy to change the behavior as opposed to somebody just telling you that you shouldn't do that. You know, that's a, a problem there when you say you shouldn't do that. It gives someone understanding. We say that to children because they can't fully understand things, but today we can logically understand. Logic gives us the power to stay in this part of the brain to adjust and interpret correctly situations. So that was a, the whole key to getting to the hormones. Once we understand biologically that if a woman, for example, goes to see her doctor, she feels, I depend on my doctor for my health, that produces a lot of estrogen and that will help lower her stress levels. So why is it that 90% of the people that go to doctors or therapists are women? You gotta, you don't have to convince a woman to go see a doctor, but to men, you gotta convince them, you gotta motivate them because basically getting help from someone is generally speaking an estrogen producer. Not that men can't ask for help, but generally men wanna do it themselves that produces testosterone. And he will ask for help when he's explored all options on his own when he realizes, okay, I can't do this on my own, I need to get help. Then he will, with no shame, nothing, he'll still be testosterone because he's finding the right person to help. So in sales, for example, if you're selling to a man or you're working with a man, you wanna, you wanna come from the place of, of, of 
you know, I've had all this experience. I've done all these things before and I can make this easier for you. So you won't have to do it. <laughs> the man goes, okay, great. He has a good excuse. You've had a lot of, you had a lot of experience. You can do this so I can depend on you. Then he feels good about depending on you. Otherwise, men typically don't reach out for help. And so we want ultimately, and I remember ultimately, is to have a balance of the masculine qualities and our feminine qualities that are appropriate for us within. And always stress, unhappiness, laziness, idleness, procrastination, all these symptoms that get in the way of productivity as well as happy relationships are all the side effects of when your hormones are out of balance. So once we have this understanding, we can start tweaking the way we communicate with people. For example, rewards. Rewards are a very big thing to men to increase testosterone. Okay, look what I did and I get acknowledged for it, appreciated for it, that bumps up testosterone. Now women want that appreciation so they can feel equal with everybody in the workplace, but it doesn't necessarily lower her stress. What lowers her stress is that when she feels back up, when she feels supported, when she feels she can be herself and supported in that. And typically in many workplaces, she can't get that because the workplace was primarily designed for men, not against women, but for men. Now it's starting to shift with more teamwork, supportive work uh, that include women more, that helps women. But even more important, as we learn these communication styles are different, we can be much more supportive to women in the workplace, which increases their willingness to participate and stay in a company and so forth and feel good about ourselves. So this is the world we're moving to. The, the, the foundation of that, once again, is good communication at home, because that's a real testing ground. It's an easier testing ground, ironically, because it's someone that you picked to be with. You can't always pick your coworkers. You can pick your job, and sometimes you can't even pick your job. So the key to this is good communication can build trust. Good communication can build connection and make the workplace a more productive and happier place. Understanding gender differences is essential for that, both at home and in the workplace, because the world is changing. It's changing in the workplace because women are part of the workplace. We're seeing the companies that have more equality between participation of women in the workplace, they are more productive and they make more money. That's all the statistics are out there about that. Flip side of that, in our relationships, the world has changed because as women are more in the workplace during the day, they're not making enough female hormones to experience happiness. So we see four times as many women taking antidepressants. Many, many women will take some kind of uh, sleeping medication to sleep. It interferes with sleep when you're out of balance. And there's this general feeling for women of, oh, there's just not enough time. There's not enough time. And of course that gets in the way of romantic feelings at home as well as patience and tolerance with your children and so forth, and it lowers your energy. So what we wanna do is recognize the culprit here is lack of understanding how we can balance our hormones. And balancing hormones is so key to being able to feel happiness and well-being. John, I'm guessing you've received over the decades because of your popularity and your influence, some criticism about perpetuating gender stereotypes. What have you done to address that and how are you helping to lead out on what are now non-traditional roles for both men and women in every facet of life? Well, I'm always at, first of all, there's a lot in that question, let me unpack it. The first thing is the criticism. I think what overcame criticism a lot, because you have to realize we're all looking teachers, you know, we wanna make the world a better place and equality between men and women is a big part of that. And I'm all about equality, but equality doesn't mean we're the same. That's a very key thing. So we need to understand people come from different perspectives. And when, when we come from different diversity, it's a big word in the workplace, come from different cultures, we're okay with that. But we still tend to shy away a bit from gender diversity. And now we have a lot of gender diversity. And there's questions I get about that all the time. And even in gay relationships, straight relationships, you know, all the different types of gender. The reality is you have a body and if your body is basically a male body, you need to communicate in a way that supports your male body. And if you have a female body, whatever gender you're with or whatever you are going to have, if you're a woman, your body can make a baby, you're going to have a huge set of different hormones which are necessary for your well-being. So for example, in a gay relationship, two women together, Sometimes whoever's upset, you know where you need to take them is more to their female side because that typically, not always exactly, typically when we're not happy, 
if you're in a woman's body, you need to bounce up your estrogen or progesterone levels, depending upon what time of the month it is. It gets a little complicated. That's why I wrote a book, Beyond Mars and Venus, to help women understand their own hormonal cycles. From the time of their period to ovulation, they require more estrogen. From the time of the ovulation to their period, they require more progesterone. And you have to have the right balance. If when you need more progesterone, if you happen to have more estrogen, that will make you very unhappy. If, you, if you're making progesterone or testosterone towards ovulation, then your estrogen levels will stay low and you won't be able to experience happiness and romance and love. Then that's one thing about science on one side. On the other side, we have social behavior and we know from researchers that when you're in a, in a relationship, I'm talking to women now, where you're dependent on somebody, at that moment, your body will be making estrogen if you feel you can get what you need. That's why feeling safe is so important for women for estrogen to go up. I'm safe, I can ask for help, I can get help, the estrogen levels will go up. Now, when the ovulation goes down to the period, if we look at it as a cycle, progesterone is the dominant hormone. It is produced when you're in an equal relationship, not dependent on each other. So you're just having fun together, you're making dinner together, you're going for a walk together, friendship, activities, singing in a choir, you know, praying to God, all these sort of activities where you're not depending on your husband, for example, or your boss, those would be more progesterone stimulating. So there's times for one type of activity and times for the other. What distinguishes both of those activities is that it's what you would like to do, what you want to do, what you love to do, and that makes it more feminine hormone. If you're doing something which is uh, fight or flight, if you're doing something which is risky, is something which is challenging, like even making decisions is a risk. Whenever you make a decision, it's a risk. Not that women shouldn't make decisions. It's that at those times, because failure or success is up for possibility, your body will make more testosterone at that time. And if you have too much of that, then you go out of balance. And what can bring us back into balance if you're a woman is to be able to, if it's on that one part of your cycle to depend on your husband and share with your husband your feelings and sharing feelings is actually one of the most powerful estrogen stimulators. Why? And this is amazing because as a therapist for years, women come in my office. I'm very good at getting women to open up and share their feelings because they know I'm non-judgmental. I ask the right questions. They feel safe. They would often cry and then they feel better. And then they walk out happy and nothing has changed in their life. And that gave me this clear insight to help men understand that quite often, if you just listen to a woman, she will process what's going on inside out loud. Whereas for a man, we often do it quietly inside. We sort of just mull it over, we think about it, we adjust and an idea emerges. Uh, so it's a different way of processing problems and stress. And if men understand this, we come back to that thing I was saying before, then you feel you're actually doing something when it really appears like you're not doing anything at all because you're not offering solutions. You're just asking questions, trying to understand. And you're not understand, You're not listening to understand in order to give advice. You might do that with a client at work, which would also be very, very successful. For men to have this, what we might call in the workplace, gender intelligence. We have emotional intelligence, then there's gender intelligence. You know, in Mars, Venus, in the workplace, I talk about 12 different examples, simple examples, where you, you can make a huge difference in working with a woman or working with a man. I'll give one example. You might have a, a, a board meeting uh, or a work a team meeting, three women, three men, and uh, three of the men are busy jumping in with questions. Maybe one or two of the women are jumping in, but one woman is kind of quiet. The men mistakenly assume she has nothing to say, but actually you need to take a little time to notice she's not talking and include her because inclusion is very important for women to feel a part of the team. To be included is massively important for women. And if men don't understand this, they will ignore her because she's not interrupting with something to say. Why will they ignore her? Because if you had a team of six guys and we're all throwing the ideas around and one guy is not saying anything, we all just assume he has nothing to say and we don't point it out because we don't want to embarrass him and say, hey, Bob, you haven't said anything. He's not waiting to have you involve him in the conversation. So conversations, work conversations can be really fast. And if a woman is tends to be more on her estrogen side, she needs a little more time to catch up. 
So you stop and you invite her. Well, what do you think? I know you're really good at this. So just not feeling included will cause a woman to feel that she is not a valued part of the team, even if she is a valued part of the team. You know, we did a study in our seminars in the workplace where of 100,000 people fill out the questionnaire. This is one of the most striking differences. And that was that women, a high number, maybe 90% of women felt they weren't being appreciated by men. And, when, and the men were asked, do you appreciate the women you work with? And 80% of the men all said, yes, I greatly appreciate the women I work with. So the reality here is she didn't feel appreciated. This man was appreciating her. What broke down? It's the communication of what appreciation, how to convey it to a woman might be different than how to a man. And I totally related to that one because that was the beginning of my first insight into gender differences back a long time ago. So back in the day when I was teaching sex and then I was teaching seminars on communication, I still didn't know that men and women were different. And my assistant, we had a small company, I was teaching seminars, my assistant would handle, handle all my counseling clients. It was a full practice. She'd collect all the money, she did the book, she paid the taxes, she organized the seminars, she got the enrollments. I mean, this woman was amazing, did everything and I didn't have to do anything except what I do, which is I counsel the people, I teach the seminars and always, never complain, never give any unsolicited advice, always happy with her. And then after a few years, she said, you know, I want to quit. And I said, why? And did I not pay you enough? She says, no, you're very generous. I just got a raise a few months ago. And I said, well, what is it? And she says, oh, it's just time to move on. And I said, well, help me understand that better. And she says, well, John, I work really hard and you have no idea what I do. And I laughed inside, not out loud, but I laughed inside because I felt that's why I appreciate her so much is that she just gets it done, no drama. I don't have to do anything. I don't even need to know. That's why I appreciated it so much. But she didn't feel that appreciation unless I got involved to know what she did. That was the key. So I asked her, I said, would you give me a couple of weeks and see if you feel appreciated then? So it wasn't my saying, boy, good job. Oh, that was great. No, what made her feel appreciated was my knowing what she goes through my knowing what she's doing, my knowing the challenges and difficulties of her journey to produce the result. Quite often, men just want to acknowledge what they did. What a great job. Look at the effect it has. Give you a reward. Yay. And not that women shouldn't get rewards either, but this is very important for men. And for women, it's very important that you know the things they went through, the challenges that they're facing, that you, if you're like working with them, that you, you know what they're doing. And that makes her feel a basic need for women, which is a bit greater in women than men, which is know what I go through, know my feelings, know my frustrations, know my challenges that I go through. Whereas for men, it's look at the results of what I do. That tends to be more important to us. Because if I say, look, look what I did, and look what I did, my testosterone goes up. You know, just you introducing me, saying how many books I've sold, I've done a good job, my testosterone goes up. If I feel like I, have, I failed, my energy goes down and you know, nobody can compete in this world. No man can compete with, you know, the very few men who make so much money and often people value their sense of worth by how much money they make. You can't, there's always going to be somebody bigger and more, but in your personal life, if somebody loves you just the way you are, that will knock your testosterone up even higher. That's the key to this is having personal relationships is the most powerful way to keep your hormones in balance as a way to then support you in coming back in the workplace. So yes, we need gender intelligence in the workplace, but we need to realize there's something called work-life balance. And everybody's talking about it, but nobody's talking about the gender intelligence that goes with it, that in your work life, you balance your work with your personal life. What is it you need to get in your personal life in order to balance those hormones so you go back into the work, workplace, which is gonna be commonly way more stress but when people don't know how to do this balance, then their life, their personal life becomes a source of stress. Then they bring that stress into the workplace. John, I wish you could see the production crew. They're all riveted behind the cameras right now, men and women alike. Thank you for that insight. I, I wanna end our conversation with my favorite chapter out of Beyond Mars and Venus. It's chapter 10 and you title it, She Needs to Be Heard 
and he needs to be appreciated. I feel like you're in my kitchen counter tonight at about 625 as our three young boys, five, seven, and nine, are running around. I've worked a full day. I want to be appreciated. My wife has been to tennis lessons. She's picked up kids. She's been to swimming, swimming camp. And she just wants to be heard on all of her conflict. Expand a bit on that as we finish our conversation. Well, I think you put it perfectly. perfectly. When you appreciate someone, their testosterone goes up. When you respect someone, honor their needs, then their estrogen goes up. And today, women have a huge need to cope with the stress of their day by talking about their feelings. So when men are just talking about what they went through and a man who listens with some empathy and, and give it 10 minutes, give it eight minutes instead of like a two minute quickie and then give her some solution, just pause and reflect on how she must feel rather than thinking what advice you could give her so she wouldn't feel that way. It's just so refreshing when a woman feels, I can say this, say, express myself. I'm not going to get corrected in any way. Just as you as a man, you want to come home and not feel that your wife's trying to make change you or correct you in any way. Because when women don't complain to us or don't correct us, we get the message that we are appreciated. And ironically, when, it, when you listen to a woman, and you help out with this or that, or you simply what's going on and show some interest to her even before the children. That's another key I like to throw mm-hmm. in there. I would come home and my children run at me, daddy, 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 and mom be making dinner. And I just play with the kids and she's feeling left out. I'm not raising her estrogen. All I had to do, I come home, I say, where's mom? After a couple of weeks, I walk home, the kids say, mom's here, mom's there. Cause I go to her first and I give her a hug I prioritize at least four hugs a day, at least an I love you once a day. All these little things, I compliment every day about how she looks, her hair, her beauty. Beauty is very feminine and also offering to help with things. All these things help women find their balance from being busy, busy, busy in the work world. They need that extra estrogen support by feeling special. So men need the testosterone from the appreciation. And ironically, women will hear that and think, what about me? I don't feel appreciated. Actually, you're not feeling seen, heard, and honored and respected. He appreciates you, of course, but he might be sitting in his chair appreciating what a great wife I have. <laughs> and you're not going to feel appreciated. What helps women feel appreciated is when you know what's going on in their life, you offer to help a little here, you listen here, you ask questions here, and then you plan a date. All of these things help to balance the sense of independence with a sense of interdependence, which here's our estrogen being produced. And for men, we feel so appreciated when you come home and she just gives you the space to be yourself for a while. Don't run after him. Don't ask him a lot of questions. But what he needs to do to earn that is come find her first, give her a hug, give her a kiss, squeeze her. She jumps in the conversation, you listen, or you can just simply say, give me a little time and then I'll be right back. And you go to your cave for 20 minutes or something, watch the news for 30 minutes. And if she's stuck in his cave, some men don't know how to come out of the cave. She could just say, oh, honey, when you're done watching that or doing that, I need your help. Boom. When a man hears he needs your help, you give him a little something to do that will help you and make sure it helps you so it makes you feel good. Whenever you feel good, man's testosterone goes up. I take my wife to the movie. She says, oh, that was a great movie. I feel like I wrote that movie. I directed that movie. So it's like knowing the subtleties of how to give your partner a lift bring out the best in them. That's what love is all about. John Gray, I want to thank you for your time today. Honestly, I feel like I'm in the presence of greatness. I, I, I've, been, I've read your books for decades. And I, I want to say to our listening audience and viewing audience, you know, off air before we went on, you mentioned that here you are, you know, almost 30 years into all of your writing of 20 plus books. You're still out writing and speaking and and coaching and counseling. You do five interviews a week. You're one of the hardest working authors in the business. Thank you for joining us today. You may have saved my marriage. I'm gonna go home and have my wife listen to this. I'm about four hugs behind. I'm one full I love you behind, and I'm definitely a physical compliment behind. I would be remiss if you did not explain to us, above your head, it looks like you've painted the heaven or something. What's going on above you behind there in your your library? Well, this is actually my cave. So I (laughs) built it into the mountain that I live on. And I built this cave and I thought, well, I'll have a a sky above me. I saw it when I was in Rome, I saw they doing this. So I designed it after kind of a a Roman thing. So it's it's refreshing to be in my little cave. Well, when you've written and sold 50 million copies, you can afford your own Sistine Chapel. John Gray, (laughs) thank you for joining us. We're honored you're here. Your recent book is Beyond Mars and Venus, 
relationship skills for today's complex world, otherwise known, how to save Scott and Stephanie Miller's marriage. Oh, and let me say one other thing at my website, marsvenus.com. I have a free course for singles, single women, single men, married men, or married women. You get your choice, a whole downloaded video course for you. So it's free. Highly recommend it, um, marsdevenus.com. John, again, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thanks everybody for joining us. Wow, that was powerful. I'm going to need to listen to that in private first and then behave for a month before my wife listens to it so it doesn't seem convenient when I adopt some of these valuable principles. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. We have some amazing interviews coming up. John Gray, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for joining us today. If you're not subscribing to On Leadership, do so by visiting franklincovey.com, clicking on the On Leadership tab, rate us, rank us, review us, and invite your friends to join as well. And while you're at it, visit um, marsvenus.com, and we'll see you back here next week. Thank you so much.